How do you change an object's state of motion? It's simple, you just need a net or unbalanced force. Newton's second law states that the acceleration of an object is equal to the net force applied to that object divided by its mass. You can see that the net force and acceleration are directly proportional, so the larger the force acting on the object, the larger its acceleration. On the other hand, the object's mass is inversely proportional to the acceleration, so if I push on two objects with the same amount of force, the object with the larger mass will have a smaller acceleration. Another way you can think of it is that mass measures how resistant an object is to changing its linear motion. Similarly, we can change an object's rotational state of motion with a net or unbalanced torque. So let's say you have this disc, and it can rotate about this axis of rotation. If I exert a force on the disc, like that, I'll get the disc to start to rotate counterclockwise. Now, this force is exerting a torque on the disc, and that's causing it to have an angular acceleration. That angular acceleration is equal to the net torque acting on the disc divided by the disc's moment of inertia. In other words, this is Newton's second law, but for rotation. And just like how a larger net force exerted on an object will result in a larger acceleration, a larger net torque acting on a rigid body will result in a larger angular acceleration. And just like how a large mass measures how resistant an object is to changing its linear motion, the moment of inertia I measures how resistant an object is to changing its rotational motion. So if I exerted the same net torque on two different objects, the one with the larger moment of inertia would have a smaller angular acceleration. So let's revisit a problem with multiple masses, m1 and m2, which are attached to each other with a string, and that string is being passed over a pulley. Except this time, the pulley is no longer ideal. Now the pulley has a mass of m3, a radius r, it's the shape of a disc, and now it has enough friction that as the string touches the pulley, the string doesn't slip, and instead it causes the pulley to rotate. We'll still consider the string to have a mass that's so small compared to the blocks that it's negligible, and for now, let's just assume that the friction between the block and the table is also negligible. So our goal will be to find the block's accelerations and also the tensions in the string. Just like we did previously, we'll set up a coordinate system such that the direction of the acceleration of the blocks will be the direction of my positive x-axis. So here you can see that m1 will be falling downward, m2 will be accelerating to the right, and so I can set up my coordinate system such that to the right here is positive x and upward is positive y. And then that coordinate system flips over the pulley, so it's starting to flip like this, and by the time it gets to m1, the positive x direction would be facing downward, and so the positive y direction would be facing to the right. Now this also means that for the pulley, any torques that cause it to spin clockwise, sort of in that direction here, where positive x is going to the right and then downward, any torque that's causing it to spin in that direction, we're going to also consider to be positive. What hidden information do we have about this situation? Well, we know that these two blocks are attached by a string, so for every, let's say, centimeter that m1 moves downward, we know that m2 is also going to move a centimeter to the right. That also means that the edge of this pulley is going to sweep out an arc length distance of a centimeter. So what that tells us is that the linear change in position, the linear velocity, and the linear acceleration are the same for both blocks and the edge of the disk. And so for our purposes, what matters is that they have the same linear acceleration. Let's draw a free body diagram and write down an equation for Newton's second law for each block and the pulley. So let's go ahead and start with M1. So M1 
clearly has a force of gravity pulling it downward of M1g and a tension pulling it upward due to the string. Now I'm going to go ahead and call that T1 and I can say that the sum of the forces acting on M1 equals M1a and here I'm only considering what's happening in the x direction so this is forces in the x direction equals ma in the x direction so that would be m1g minus t1 equals m1 times a. Now since they have the same accelerations I'm just going to call ax a. Now let's look at what's going on with m2. Okay. Now m2 still of course has the force of gravity m2g a normal force of the table pushing upwards on M2 and a tension pulling to the right of T2. Now in the Y direction we know the normal force is balancing with M2G and that's not really of interest to us right now so I'm only going to look at what's going on in the X direction. I'll say some of the forces in the X direction equals MA in the X direction and this is for block 2. So that would just be T2 equals M2 times A. And again, this acceleration is the same as this acceleration. Now let's look at the pulley. So since we're interested in how it rotates about its axis, we actually have to draw it as an extended body instead of a point particle. So here I'm actually going to draw it as a circle. And this is the axis of rotation. Now we know that since tensions can only pull, this rope of T1 can only pull downward on it, right? You can't push with the rope. So I know that T1 is going downward and it's acting at the edge of that pulley right there. So that's T1. And again, I know that ropes only pull. So this tension, which is T2, can only pull it to the left. This object also has a mass, so it has a force of gravity of m3g acting on it, and the axle must be keeping it from falling downward and from being pulled inward, so we know that there's some force of the axle hole going in that direction. Now, since this pulley isn't moving translationally, right, it's not accelerating up or down or left or right, we're not really interested in the net forces acting on the pulley. What we're really interested in are the net torques acting on the pulley. So what things cause it to rotate? Now we know that torque is equal to R cross F, which is the same as the magnitude of R times the magnitude of F times the sine of the sandwich angle, or in other words, the angle between R and F. So if you see M3G is acting right on the axis of rotation as is the axle force. So neither of these is contributing a torque. So for our case, even though these forces are acting there, they're not really important for our problem solving. So I'm going to take them away just to make it a little bit cleaner to see what's happening. We can see that T1 is providing a torque to try to get the pulley to spin clockwise. And from our coordinate system, we said that was a positive torque. So I'm just going to put a little positive sign here to help us remember that when we do our problem solving. T2, however, is causing it to want to spin counterclockwise. So based on our coordinate system, that would be a negative torque. Now before, when our pulleys were ideal and massless, the tension T1 and T2 had the same magnitude. But we're about to see that now, since our pulley has mass and the string is rotating the pulley, this can no longer be the case. For the pulley to start to rotate clockwise, we know that there has to be a net torque acting on it, causing it to rotate clockwise. So what we see here is that the torque caused by T1 has to be greater than the torque caused by T2. So let's go ahead and write our Newton's second law for rotation. It's the sum of the torques equals I alpha. Now this is pretty important that you don't want to get torques confused with tensions. Okay, so torques you have to go through the math and say that's R, F, sine, theta, whereas tension is simply the force. 
So for tension one, we can see that the R value, okay, is the distance from the axis of rotation to the force. So this is little r, and in our case, little r is capital R. It's the radius of the pulley. So the torque caused by T1 is just capital R times T1 times the sine of the angle between R and T1. And you can see right there that it's 90 degrees. So that's the torque caused by T1, and we said that was going to be positive. And then we subtract the torque T2 because that's causing a rotation in the negative direction. So we would say that that torque is again R, okay, which is the distance from the axis of rotation to the force. And in this case, little r is the same as the radius of the pulley times T2 times the sine of the angle between R and the force, which again is 90. And that equals the moment of inertia of the pulley, which we looked up in a table and we would see that the moment of inertia about a, of a disc about its center of mass is simply one half times the mass of the disc times the radius of the disc squared. So that would be one half times m3 r squared and that's multiplied by alpha. Now here we can see that since an r appears in every single term we can cancel that out and now, if we look at what we have, it seems as though we have three equations, but four unknowns, because we don't know T1, we don't know acceleration, we don't know T2, and we don't know alpha. So at first, this might look like it's impossible to solve, but this is when we go back to our hidden information. The acceleration that M2 and M1 experience was the same as the tangential acceleration of the edge of the pulley. So we know that we can relate this tangential acceleration to alpha. And we know that the acceleration in the tangential direction is equal to alpha times r. So for us, we know that alpha equals a over r. And in this case, r is simply the radius of the pulley. So now, since we know that the acceleration is the same for M2, M1, and the edge of this pulley, and that tangential acceleration is related to the angular acceleration of the pulley, we can substitute in A over R for our alpha. So now we have T1 times the sine of 90, which is simply 1, minus T2 times the sine of 90, which again is 1, equals 1 half M3 R, times alpha, which is A over R. And again, this acceleration is the same as this acceleration. So you see that R's cancel out, and now you have T1 minus T2 equals 1 half M3 times acceleration. So at this point, you've actually done all of the physics. And if we wanted to solve for the tensions and the accelerations, it would just be solving simultaneous equations. So if you feel comfortable solving simultaneous equations, go ahead and try it on your own and fast forward to the end of the video and see if our answers match up. So here the equations are again, just giving me a little bit more room to do some algebra. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and solve for T1. So I get M1G minus M1A equals T1. So now I'll take this equation and just substitute in T1 and T2. So I have T1 minus T2 equals 1 half M3 times A. And T1 is just M1G minus M1A minus T2 is M2A. And that equals 1 half times M3A. And since I'm solving for acceleration, let's go ahead and get all the accelerations on one side. So this would be M1G equals 1 half M3A plus M1A plus M2A. And now if I pull out an acceleration, that just becomes 1 half M3 plus M1 plus M2 equals M1G. And I just have the acceleration is equal to M1G divided by 1 half M3 
plus m1 plus m2. Now we can actually make sense of this answer thinking about limiting cases. Imagine back when our pulleys had no mass. The difference here would be that m3 would be equal to zero. So if we take m3 to be zero, then we'd have an acceleration of m1g divided by m1 plus m2, which actually makes perfect sense because the force that's accelerating the system of the two blocks So if you have m2 and m1, the force of gravity on m1 is actually accelerating the combination of these two blocks. So this answer would be exactly what we would expect if the pulley had no mass. That's pretty reassuring. Now we can also go back and find the tensions in each string. So the easy one here is T2, because T2 is simply just m2 times what we just found. So T2 would just be m2 times m1g over 1 half m3 plus m1 plus m2 and t1 would just be m1g minus m1 times the acceleration we just found. So that would be m1g minus m1 times m1g over 1 half m3 plus m1 plus m2. And that's how you solve these pulley problems when the pulley is no longer ideal and it actually has mass.